Bueno, buenas tardes a todos ustedes. Gracias por su puntualidad. Estamos con un poquito de presión de tiempo, pero yo creo que en esta sesión de tarde vamos a disfrutar, cerrando definitivamente este Congreso, donde pienso que ha habido tan interesantes experiencias de presentación de conocimiento, de investigación y de teoría. Quiero agradecer la presencia aquí del profesor David Lomas. Thank you and welcome here, David. Eh, el profesor Lomas es profesor de Historia del Arte en la Universidad de Manchester. También es codirector con otro, otra de nuestras invitadas, Tone Addis, del Centro de Estudios del Surrealismo y su herencia en los Estados Unidos. Él tiene formación tanto en Medicina como en Historia del Arte, y por eso la relación entre el surrealismo, la cultura, la medicina, la psicología y el psicoanálisis ha sido bastante central en su investigación. Verán ustedes que en la organización de las sesiones del Congreso eh, he, he querido, hemos querido eh, situar esta última sesión eh, como en un paso después de lo que sería el surrealismo histórico. Entonces, con el profesor Lomas vamos a tener eh, la ocasión de entrar en un análisis de la problemática del sueño después de los planteamientos de la neurociencia y a partir de la situación actual. Y con Ana de Cés, que hablará después del profesor Lomas, intentaremos, eh, a través de su punto de vista, hacer una presentación de la herencia del surrealismo en el arte posterior. Precisamente, el profesor Lomas, además de trabajar eh, con eh, Tone Ades, también ha trabajado con Anadeses en eh, una exposición muy reciente, Espacios subversivos, surrealismo y arte contemporáneo, que, como pueden im imaginar, está en el núcleo del interés de lo que queremos presentar en esta, eh, eh, en esta sesión de tarde. Y quiero también mencionar su último libro, publicado en 2013, eh, Simulando lo maravilloso, psicología, surrealismo, posmodernismo. Es decir, entramos ahora en cómo la estela del surrealismo y, por otro lado, las investigaciones sobre el sueño, el profesor Lomas va a hablar específicamente sobre una cuestión muy interesante, el sonambulismo, pero cómo la estela del surrealismo irradia en un sentido positivo o en un sentido de transformación en la fase, en la situación actual de nuestra cultura. Nada más. Muchas gracias, David. You can uh, be begin as you, when you like. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Yosef, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, congratulations on uh, uh, mounting such an interesting and uh, intelligently uh, conceived um, show. It's uh, really a you know, privilege to both to be able to see it and uh, to take part in this um, conference. Um, it's, it's quite um, possibly um, bad manners to talk about um, another exhibition um, on an occasion such as this, and particularly one that I was um, involved in organizing. Um, but I wanted to give you um, some explanation uh, um, before I begin my lecture um, proper about how it was that I came to the subject of sleepwalking. Um, in 2009, um, um, my colleague at the time, uh, Anna Deserz, who will be um, giving a lecture later, and myself um, uh, curated an exhibition at the Whitworth Art Gallery in uh, Manchester that um, uh, traveled uh, within the UK. Um, and it was called uh, Subversive spaces, and it set out to explore the relationship between surrealism and contemporary art. Um, so, um, uh, just sort of by way of a preamble, I wanted to say, you know, a few words about um, this uh, exhibition. You can see the um, 
uh, catalogue, uh, the cover of the accompanying catalogue there. The, the exhibition, um, as I say, um, endeavoured to sort of plot um, various trajectories um, from uh, surrealism to contemporary um, practice. Um, and there were, there were two um, main strands within this. We'd um, chosen the rubric of um, space, and um, the, the first of these strands concerned um, interiority and um, uh, psychic um, disturbance, um, a, a subject that I seem sort of particularly well suited to um, investigate. And um, uh, this is, you know, just um, an instance of the um, kinds of um, pairings that um, we um, uh, set up within uh, the show. On the left-hand side there, as you can see, a, a, a photograph by um, Hans Bellmer that um, you, you can see it um, in uh, the exhibition upstairs, a, a, a very um, 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 diminutive uh, a photograph compared with the projection there, which um, um, sh shows a, a scene which um, could be um, the aftermath of a um, scene of um, child abuse, um, perhaps. Um, and on the right-hand side in uh, this uh, work by um, Louise Bourgeois, um, which is, has, has a very uh, similar setting at the bottom of a um, staircase. The um, father, or at least his um, um, symbol, the um, phallus, is, as it were, sort of, you know, strung up and he's uh, uh, punished for this uh, crime. Um, um, this was another um, pairing uh, within the show, um, again in the section that I uh, curated. Um, and once again, the photograph on the left is one that you can see in the show upstairs. And um, we um, drew connections between that and um, a video piece by Lucy Gunning called um, uh, a contemporary um, British artist called, um, titled Climbing Around My Room. Um, and in the accompanying uh, text, I related um, that work in particular, but also indirectly Cahans to um, uh, studies that had been made of the behavior of wild animals in uh, captivity when they sort of, you know, climb around the um, walls of their enclosure. Um, now, the other um, section of the show, which was uh, curated by Anna, um, concerned um, urban space and um, particularly sort of wandering and uh, strolling within the city, which as I'll be um, uh, elaborating on later was a sort of favorite uh, privileged uh, topos for the surrealists. Um, and on the left there, we see one of the, um, an open uh, spread from uh, Breton's Nadja. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side, um, another uh, video piece from the show by uh, Francis um, Alice. Um, and this uh, trajectory was explored um, via, um, as you might imagine, via um, situationism and um, other sort of intervening um, Movements. Um, my computer's already gone to sleep, uh, which is quite appropriate for the. Um, oh, um, no, it was just my. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, it was rather late in the day, actually, that I hit upon the subject of sleepwalking, and which I realized, uh, and as I'll explain later, um, sort of trespasses across the, uh, the, the sort of demarcation between in interior and um, outer space and wandering that uh, structured our show. Um, 
Oh. Yeah, that's strange. The uh <laughs> text is. Uh oh, there was meant to be a, a black background for these um, beginning here. Um, okay, it may be that I'll have to um, do without the little. Um, uh, snippets of text that I also included. I, th I think we can uh, probably, I, I, I can probably uh, manage without that. Um, anyway, um, my um, talk um, proper begins at, uh, at this point. Writing in the Surrealist Manifesto, um, Breton regrets that, quote, the dream finds itself reduced to a mere parenthesis as is the night. Sleepwalking, among the more bizarre manifestations of a psychopathology of everyday life, vividly illustrates the permeability of the dream with waking life that Breton posited as surrealism's goal. This, the most salient attribute of sleepwalking, only partially accounts for its appeal to the surrealists, however. My paper today is a very um, preliminary attempt to think through the status of sleepwalking for surrealism. As far as I know, there is no literature on this subject at all. Something that belongs to a domain of shadows and night has been allowed to remain there. My task is to draw it into the light, but without dissipating its essential strangeness. To do so, I shall first of all examine medical accounts of sleepwalking in the period immediately preceding surrealism, where one finds already fully formed a proto-surrealist vocabulary employed to describe a phenomenon that intrigued, yet at the same time eluded the grasp of positivist medicine. I shall then turn to a surrealist writing and imagery with the aim of ferreting out an unsuspected army of sleepwalkers. Finally, I shall look briefly at a few instances of a possibly surprising <coughs> resurgence of this quintessentially surrealist topos within contemporary art practice. The juxtaposition can be retrospectively illuminating with regard to the Surrealist project. Um, as I've already uh, indicated, uh, the only explicit depiction of a sleepwalker in subversive spaces was this photograph by George Platt Lines, who was involved with the New York-based Surrealist group. The work is a composite of two negatives whose point of suture is marked by a horizontal plane. The space above the partition is occupied by a crouching figure, asleep, possibly dreaming, while the same model with pert buttocks is shown standing or striding in the space beneath. Employing a montage technique, the photographer has created an elegant visual equivalent of the linguistic conjunction sleep walking and in a sense provided me with my title. Given the undisguised homoeroticism of Platt Lines as sleep walker, it is a wonder that Breton tolerated the presence of this um, particular work in the landmark show Fantastic Art Dada Surrealism at the Museum of Modern Art New York in 1936. Maybe he had no say in the matter, or perhaps his interest in the subject matter overrode his abhorrence of homosexuality. Um, now, as I say, um, I had intended um, that my slides would have a black background, um, so you won't be able to see the um, captions, or which, which, are, which are in white text, or the other text that I've added, but we'll just have to manage without those. Um, uh, sleepwalking was 
avidly studied by physicians and psychologists in the late 19th century, a resume of Charcot's teachings on the subject by Dr. Paul Bloch began by remarking that, as with all that belongs to, quote, to the domain of the marvelous, a key term in the Surrealist lexicon, somnambulism is shrouded in obscurity. In normal or physiological somnambulism, for which the term noctambulism is reserved, there is no other evidence of illness. This form occurs commonly in children and is rare in adults. It occurs ordinarily in the middle of the night. After several hours of sleep, suddenly the subject rises from his bed. For a variable period of time, he goes about the most diverse acts, of which no memory is conserved, before returning to sleep. The subject, notes Bloch, seems always to be acting out a dream. Uh, the term he uses is un rêve en action. He describes it as, quote, the motor expression of a dream, which by reason of its intensity or the special state of the subject, passes from an idea to an act. Somnambulism was also recognized uh, in, in, in the period that I'm talking about as a concomitant of hysteria. One of the Salpetriere hysterics, um, a topic of um, fascination for the Surrealists, of course, um, evidently leapt from a window while sleepwalking and then ran about in the garden below. The ground at the time being frozen, she gathered up snow like flowers for an invisible bouquet. Charcot uh, indirectly acknowledges the um, 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 proximity to play acting when he refers to the sleepwalking scene from Macbeth, seeking endorsement for his own clinical acumen in this literary locus classicus for sleepwalking, Charcot makes great play of the fact that Lady Macbeth's eyes are observed to be, quote, open, but their sense is shut. The fixed stare of a sleepwalker is or becomes one of the telltale signs. Indeed, as we shall see, by the time of the Surrealists, a veritable cinematic cliché. Bloch remarks that the somnambulist typically has eyes wide open with contracted pupils and a fixed stare. However, he or she appears to see only an inner drama, ignoring the people and objects about them. Thus, in the sleepwalking episode of Macbeth, the doctor and the woman are an onstage audience, and Lady Macbeth is the unconscious actor of a play within a play that we do not actually see, but only infer. It is, to use Freud's phase, uh, a phrase for the unconscious, another scene, a scene unseen. Henry uh, Fuseli's portrayal of this scene serves as a kind of prototype for certain images I will discuss later. First of all, note the stage curtain uh, repoussoir at the left. At the right, in the mid-distance, are the doctor and woman who define the backward extremity of a shallow theatrical space occupied by the sleepwalker. The elongated picture plane um, is analogous to a graph with a baseline and regular vertical calibrations that produce a temporal axis coincident with the direction of movement. Well before the invention of photography, Fuseli has intuited the symbolic and expressive potential of black and white in relation to a condition that represents, in the word of the bard, a grand perturbation in the natural order of night and day. A band of light punctuates the darkness on either side, day reduced to a mere parenthesis, so to speak, between two nights. The arms, extended to front and behind the sleepwalking Lady Macbeth, 
like a conductor linking night to night, creating the continuity of a dream world despite the appearance of waking activity. The other peculiar feature of the drawing is the trailing nightdress that precisely echoes the lower border of the curtain. It is as if the sleepwalker, though physically present, is a veil covering over an unpresentable scene. We are made aware, however, uh, that, however, that however many curtains are drawn aside, that enigmatic scene cannot be shown. Most sleepwalk sleepwalkers travel no further than their bedroom. There were, however, scattered case reports of fugues in the course of which people could travel long distances before coming to their senses. Charcot reported an interesting case of a Parisian salesman with a tendency to désambulation. In the course of his habitual occupation, the man would lose consciousness suddenly, and I quote, begin walking resolutely without knowing where he was going in the manner of an automaton and not gaining, regaining lucidity until after a period of time varying from several hours to several days. On one occasion, he awoke to find himself on a suspension bridge in the town of Brest, ha having presumably traveled there by train. For the, du the duration of this episode, um, the episode, this man was remiss um, let alone, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, um, sorry, I'll begin that again. For the duration of the episode, this man carried out the actions of a normal waking person without arousing suspicion that anything was remiss, let alone that he was unconscious. Charcot coined the term ambulatory automatism for such cases. The very terminolo terminology shows what a rich terrain psychology offered to surrealism and adds to the conviction that undirected walking is an extension of the surrealist notion of automatism. Ian Hacking notes a spate of uh, similar reports, beginning with the case of Albert, described by Dr. Philippe Tissier in 1887, Medical interest in Les Aliens Voyageurs waned uh, sharply after the first decade of the 1900s, paralleling the decline of the hysteria diagnosis. Some historians have therefore viewed the condition as a male counterpart to female hysteria. In common with female hysteria, those with the condition were not infrequently suspected of imposture particularly in cases of desertion from the army. Given Breton's first-hand experience with psychiatric cases during the First World War, it is not inconceivable that he encountered the condition or had learnt about it. <clears throat> In their resolute determination to escape the drudgery of their middle-class lives and work by walking, these um, cases anticipate one of the surrealists' most precious pastimes. Were they deliberately following in the footsteps of these now forgotten somnambulists? In the Entretien, Breton recounted a walk undertaken by Aragon, Maurice, Vitrac and himself in the early 1920s in which the self-imposed disorientation began to induce untoward psychological effects in some of those taking part. He recalls, we started out from Blois, a town we had picked at random on a map. It was agreed that we would head off haphazardly on foot. The project turned out to be quite peculiar and even fraught with danger. The absence of any goal soon removed us from reality, gave rise beneath our feet to increasingly numerous and disturbing phantoms. The trip um, had to be abandoned, though Breton is adamant that the experience was not wasted, since 
like the condition which it perhaps uh, intended to emulate, quote, it probed the boundaries between waking life and dream life. In an era uh, before night buses, walking long distances at night time was commoner, commoner than it is nowadays. Nocturnal wandering is a privileged surrealist topos. Shortly after they met in the early 1920s, Breton recalls being invited by Max Ernst to, in, to accompany him on a nighttime stroll through Paris. They covered a quite remarkable distance before returning home at daybreak. Our steps led us towards the Quai de Bercy, prematurely gloomy, the wine market at Léal, swept by acrid, heady fumes, the Châtelet district, where the streets are lined with orthopedic appliances, making ingenious efforts to prop up human beings. The slaughterhouses of La Viette, where the sky is visible through the cattle drovers' blouses. The, the account, uh, Breton's account, concludes with the injunction, wander, the wings of augury will come and attach themselves to your shoulders. Further along in the same essay, Breton imagines Ernst in his lop lop persona swooping down towards the mountains of Tibet, and I quote, there, so travelers report, transparent men endowed with the wings of asceticism cover impossible distances along the precipitous footpaths. Alexandra David Neal in Magic and Mystery in Tibet, a source familiar to Breton, recounts tales of religious initiates who were almost supernaturally fleet of foot and capable of remarkable feats of endurance, reputedly traveling large distances continuously over three or four days at a time. Their exotic counterparts to Charcot's ambulatory automatists, as well as, of course, to Breton and Ernst. On their return journey that night, the pair was joined by a mysterious naked woman who dances in circles, keeping up uh, with them all the while, a dancing somnambulist or figment of their overheated imaginations, who is to know? In Communicating Vessels, uh, um, a, a book that he published in 1932, Breton tangentially connects somnambulism with the activity of strolling with a casually interjected remark, and I quote, as I was walking along the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Honoré with les amants somnambule under my arm, and so he goes on, further down the same paragraph, Breton ruminates upon the equivalence between his mental state during his wanderings in the streets of Paris and the dream state, the only difference being that, quote, here I am lying down sleeping, and there I am really moving around in Paris. The novel in question, reflecting Breton's penchant for Gothic literature, was Mademoiselle Caro, uh, which was actually a pseudonym for uh, Mademoiselle Van Hove, uh, and the title of the book was Edmond et Juliette, or Ou Les Amants Somnambules, and it was first published in Paris in 1820. Um, and I should just sort of add that um, uh, somnambulism, sleepwalking, um, really only appears as a conspicuous subject um, within literature in the late 18th uh, and through into the early um, 19th century in um, France and elsewhere in Europe. A more obscure allusion to somnambulism is made in the guise of a cricket that Breton said accompanied him and Ernst on their nighttime walk. It turns out that this nocturnal insect sprang from the pages of Lautréamont's Les Chants de Maldoro, where it is one of the many disguises assumed by the rebellious anti-hero of the novel. 
This cricket lives in the sewers of great cities and spreads a hypnotic fluid through the, su the subterranean channels. And I quote, mesmerizing the prosperous capitals with a pernicious fluid, he leads them into a lethargic state in which they are incapable of keeping watch upon themselves as they should, a state the more dangerous for being unsuspected. This cricket is also extremely fleet of foot, and I quote, today he is in Madrid, tomorrow he will be in St. Petersburg, yesterday he was in Peking. As a kind of talisman, the cricket first makes its appearance in Breton's poem, The Sunflower, written in 1923, which he reprints in L'Amour Fou in 1937, in the context of his account of another stroll at night with his soon-to-be lover, Jacqueline Lambda. Somnambulism is as much a privileged figure for an indecipherable, indecipherable enigma as is the Tour Saint-Jacques, encountered by the amant somnambule in their walk and apostrophized by Breton in his text. And I quote, I was near you again, my beautiful wanderer, and you showed me in passing the Tour Saint-Jacques under its pale scaffolding, rendering it for some time now the world's great monument to the hidden. The date that uh, Breton assigns to the excursion with Ernst, namely the early 1920s, suggests that it may have coincided with the Epoque des Sommets when the Surrealists experimented for a while with hypnotic trances. Breton has left a vivid recollection of these chaotic episodes. On one occasion, at a party in a large, dimly lit house, some ten people had fallen into a hypnotic slumber. The comings and goings of these somnambulists each trying to outdo the other with prophecies and wild gesticulations reminds Breton of the famous convulsionaries of saint Medar. Breton reports that around two in the morning, he found several of them in an anteroom attempting to hang themselves from a coat rack, and he was forced to rouse them unceremoniously from their slumber while on another occasion, uh, after a dinner party at Eluard's house, Robert Desnos, in a state of induced somnambulism, chased the dinner host around the lawn with a knife. It was the, this last episode that prompted Breton to put a halt to these activities. Cinema in the period of the Surrealists was replete with sleepwalkers. Breton's account of the Surrealists' goings-on in the early post-war years resonate with the masterpiece of expressionist film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari of uh, 1919, where the malevolent Dr. Caligari induces the somnambulist Cesare to commit a murder whilst under his hypnotic control. And um, we should have a film clip. Um, now, I, yes, yes. Oh, this doesn't do anything. Oh, okay. Mm. Mm. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm. <laughs> I'll sleep for a little bit. Mm. 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 <laughs> There's something more meant to happen than that. Uh, but, uh, Oh, okay. Well, this this should be the film clip if it, if it can be. Uh, but I, I'd need a control to. Uh... Oh, okay. Oh, okay. You can even drink that. Oh, hmm. here we go. Hmm.
Okay. <laughs> this is this is all a little bit uh, <laughs> not entirely as I predicted. Oh, oh, okay. Hmm. Oh, gosh. Um. Okay. Um. Now, curiously. Uh, I hope you noticed the, the stare of uh, Caligari. Um, curiously, on the 2nd of October 1922, the Surrealist leader wrote to Man Ray request him, requesting him to photograph the trance sessions and, in particular, Desnos, the hypnotic subject par excellence, quote, at the moment where asleep he raises to the onlookers his astonishingly troubled eyes. One wonders if Breton, in his desire to have these events documented, and Desnos, in his desire to please the surrealist leader, had not unknowingly colluded in replicating a cinematic cliché. Um, and this was, uh, the, these were the um, photographs that, um, uh, uh, that uh, Man Ray took, uh, which, which Breton, uh, reproduced in uh, um, Nadja, and um, we worked out, managed to work out that the photographs must have been um, sort of stage or, staged or, 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 or restaged, performed um, in um, uh, Man Ray's apartment, because you can see in the background there one of um, Duchamp's studies for um, The Bride. <clears throat> a little bit of uh, art historical uh, detective work there. Um, now, um, somnambulism is referred to explicitly in the titles of various surrealist pictures. Man Ray's Danseur sous le ciel, um, subtitled Le Noctambule of um, 1922, which um, as you might have predicted, is my favorite work in the current show, um, is indicative of his lively interest in the phenomenon. A somnambulist dancer appears to tumble, tumble, topple forward, casting a shadow on the frame at the lower edge of the picture, which I surmise is a sloping rooftop. And certainly there are sort of indications of sort of architecture of a, of a building on either side there of this uh, sort of stage-like um, painting. Um, sleepwalkers were notorious for feats of exceptional agility. Bloch recalls the well-known stories of sleepwalkers um, nimbly navigating their way along balustrades and rooftops. In 19... Seven, Emil Magnan reported the case of a somnambulist dancer whose stage name was Magdalene, who was able to improvise elaborate dance routines whilst in a trance state that she was apparently incapable of performing outside of hypnosis. 
Manyan speculated that hypnosis gave the subject access to her subconscious, which from the late 19th century had come to be viewed as a wellspring of spontaneous creative activity, as in this woman's talent for improvised dance, or for that matter, the surrealist's later exercise of automatic writing and drawing. Now, <clears throat> additionally, um, I want to uh, argue here that the presence of sleepwalking may be suspected um, even where it's not uh, overtly signposted. The usual solution to the kinds of incongruities presented by uh, surrealist pic images is to claim that the picture is a dream or nightmare, but in some instances they may be better understood as inhabited by sleepwalkers. Dorothea Tanning's Eine Kleine Nachtmusik of 1943 is set in an eerie hotel corridor with a uniform row of doors, the furthest of which is ajar. A girl with long tresses propped against a door frame has closed eyes. Is she awake or asleep? A second child stands rigidly facing the opposite direction to the first. They both have a disheveled appearance, as if they had just stirred from sleeping. Noctambulism, as noted before, occurs um, most frequently in childhood. In an essay on, quote, the most recent tendencies in surrealist painting that he um, published in 1938, Breton remarked cryptically, and I quote, the most startling scene in a modern Gothic novel might well consist of an encounter between a somnambulist and a female hotel thief, Suri Dotel, in a corridor. <coughs> Um, the ubiquitous naked women that populate um, Paul Delvaux's canvases, wide-eyed and impassive, zombie-like, unperturbed by their nakedness, are they not aimless sleepwalkers too? It's instructive to compare Delvaux's uh, Street of the Trams, which I show here a picture of 1938, um, with another well-known well filmic depiction of sleepwalking. Um, and could we have uh, that uh, s film clip, please? <laughs> it's coming. Mm. <laughs> Sleepwalkers take their time. They can't be rushed. Um, okay, the, the vampire movie Nosferatu of 1922, beloved of the surrealists, con contains a scene in which Ellen, the wife of the main protagonist, dressed in a flowing white nightdress, glides along a moonlit balustrade, having sensed the imminent peril of her husband, who is far away in the castle of Count Orloff. Her raised arms and staring eyes strangely echo the vampire who closes in on his sleeping victim at that very moment. The camera, as you saw, tracks her movement from right to left, and at the midpoint of the frame, we see her cross a kind of threshold. The presence of a curtain once again is a cue for us to recognize that we are debarred from the imaginary scene in which the sleepwalker acts. Um, Okay, um, no. <laughs> Turning back to Delvaux, we, we notice a curtain at the front ed edge of a room without walls. 
inside two identical twins march resolutely from the same starting point, one moving towards us and the other poised at a threshold, demarcating inner and outer space which she is about to cross. One readily imagines her arms extended in front of her, but Delvaux, perhaps to avoid a too obvious invocation of the stereotype, has folded the visible arm back to the body. Sleepwalkers blithely trespass over the boundaries of public and private, of inside and outside, a dépaysement that Delvaux underscores in Street of Tr the Trams by rendering the walls of the house transparent. And just referring back to Eine Kleine Nacht music, the hotel, a privileged locus in the surrealist imaginary, is similarly ambiguous, being neither fully public nor private. Um, I um, carefully scanned the many very fine Delvaux pictures in the show here in su search of support for my hypothesis. At the right foreground of the Tate um, sleeping Venus is a striding figure whose arms are inexplicably raised and outstretched, a pose I recognize as belonging to the iconographical repertoire of sleepwalking. In the midground is a group of women apparently in the throes of extreme emotion for which Breton's comparison of his fellow surrealists with the convulsionaries of Saint-Médard springs readily to mind. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to turn now briefly to um, some instances uh, from contemporary art and several uh, exhibitions uh, in the course of the past decade have charted a resurgent, in, resurgent interest in contemporary art with sleep dreams and even sleep walking, uh, reprising these core surrealist themes. Um, and I hope that in talking about this I won't be um, treading on the toes of my um, dear colleague, um, Anna, who's about to speak. Um, Marie-Ange Guillemineau's Nuit Blanche of 1994, uh, on the left there, a work shown in subversive spaces, documents the artist roaming the streets of um, Bilbao at night time. The piece consists of a video and a luminous shroud worn by the artist, which conferred a ghostly appearance as she wandered the largely deserted streets. Guillemino was suffering from insomnia at the time of her performance. Her sleeplessness and the artwork generated by the experience can be seen as symptomatic byproducts, a way of deferring sleep that has something fearful connected with it. On the surface, this would seem to be the opposite case to sleepwalking. However, for the psychologist Pierre Janet, the two conditions stemmed from the same cause. Janet described a case of insomnia associated with signs of hysteria in a woman admitted to the Salpetriere Hospital. This woman claimed not to have slept for two years. It emerged under hypnosis that the sleep disturbance was due to a traumatic dream that each time she fell asleep would immediately cause her to awaken. Janet attributed the insomnia to the action of a subconscious fixed idea of which the woman was unaware when awake, and he reported other cases where such a pathological idea had produced not insomnia but somnambulism. The Mexican uh, surrealist artist Remedios Varro depicted sleepless, disembodied eyes in, uh, in insomnia, the picture on the right-hand side, which was painted in um, 1947. Repeated quasi-cinematically, they convey a restless nocturnal journey from the darkened rooms of a bare, unfurnished house through to a foreground where moths flap fitfully around the electric luminosity of a candle. 
I had assumed too rashly that um, Varro must have suffered herself from the affliction that she portrays so eloquently. In fact, it turns out to have been one of several um, publicity images that she made for a Mexican subsidiary of Bayer, the um, pharmaceutical company. Um, <clears throat> Australian artist uh, Rosalind Piggott made uh, La Somnambule, uh, dated 1996-97, uh, after returning from a lengthy stay in Paris in 1994 and 1995. Two handmade silk garments face each other on a horizontal axis transected by an oval sheet of perspex. The work consequently possesses a mirror-like symmetry. Piggott, in fact, <laughs> describes the transparent plane as like a mirror without backing, une glace en ten. One might, be in, uh, one might interpret the work as a spatial representation of a psychical structure consisting of the conscious and unconscious separated by a partition. Breton, in the Manifesto of Surrealism, of course, reported a curious phrase, namely, a man is cut in two by a window that seemed to represent the partitioning of his own mind. Piggott has painstakingly unraveled the cross threads from the lower section of one of the dresses, leaving a diaphanous fringe composed of the remaining vertical threads. Some of the removed threads cling to the garment opposite it, which is covered with tiny clothes hooks. Suspended by nylon, the installation hovers weightlessly in space, conveying an impression of ghostliness. The garments themselves were modeled on an old-fashioned night dresses that Piggott found in a flea market in Paris. The elongated arms bring to mind a straitjacket and by association a 19th century photographic history of female madness, not excluding the Salpetriere hysterics in their white hospital gowns. La Somnambule coincides with a spate of works from the early 1990s by Louise Bourgeois and others reassessing the legacy of Salpetriere hysteria. Perhaps it is these ghostly somnambulists whose, whose, somnambulists whose lost footsteps, par perdu, are res resurrected by Piggott. <clears throat> Tony Matelli's hyper-real sleepwalker of 1997 was showcased in Mike Kelly's artist-curated exhibition, The Uncanny. First mounted in 1993 and updated and reinstalled at Tate Liverpool in 2004, this exhibition elicited a genealogy for, the, for a postmodern artistic trend that Kelly dubbed mannequin art. Kelly brought together a plethora of casts and other facsimiles of the human body, waxwork figurines, anatomical models, death masks, patient simulators, inflatable sex toys, ventriloquists' dolls, shop floor dummies, artificial limbs, robots, and so forth. Surrealism loomed large as an antecedent for this present-day obsession, with actual works by Belmer, Dali, and Duchamp, together with documentary photographs of the Corridor of Mannequins, a highlight of the International Surrealist Exhibition in 1938. Matelli's uh, sleepwalker procures a sense of unease through the viewer's proximity to a waxworks figure that carries out an action normally associated with being awake in an automatic manner without volitional control. The burgeoning sexuality of the adolescent boy seems not unconnected with its disturbing effect. In this respect, I'm inclined to d discern an affinity with Eric Fischel's Sleepwalker of 1979 on the right-hand uh, side, which dared to show a teenage boy jerking off in a suburban backyard. 
the sleepwalking motif is mobilized strategically to trouble the complacent normality of middle-class suburbia. One is reminded that suburbia is also explicitly designated as the setting for Delvaux's Street of the Trams, which is known by the alternative title of Bonlieu, or um, suburb. All these works affect a transvaluation of the everyday by disclosing something indescribably strange within it. In parentheses, I want to suggest that the sleepwalking motif may have been transmitted to artists such as Matelli via the cinema. Parker Tyler, who was editor of View magazine, was a key player in the US reception of surrealism, claimed that the somnambulous Cesare in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari was a role model for an entire generation of experimental surrealist filmmakers, the likes of Maya Deren, Stan Brackage, and so on, spawning a genre that has been dubbed the trance film. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm sorry, there was meant to be a, uh, some text on the right-hand side that we can manage without. Um, and um, in uh, these concluding remarks, I, I, I just wanted to um, uh, make some comments uh, about uh, the uncanny um, in, in, in relation to my subject and surrealism more generally. Um, perhaps the most influential reading of surrealism in recent decades, Hal Foster's Compulsive Beauty um, of 1993, posited the Freudian uncanny as the master key through which to comprehend the movement and its artistic production. Several other authors, before and since, have added weight to a perception that the surreal and the uncanny are virtually synonyms for each other. As the equation of surrealism with the uncanny has become a nigh unquestioned article of faith, it has been too easily overlooked that the surrealists never or rarely used the term, which at any rate translates but awkwardly into French. They, for reasons of their own, uh, preferred instead the marvelous. The marvelous understood as the marker of a perturbation in the order of everyday reality. Now, um, Freud's um, uh, The Uncanny, uh, an essay of 1919, acknowledges a, a prior essay on the subject by Ernst Gensch, who had instanced, quote, waxworks figures, ingeniously constructed dolls and automata as a chief source of the uncanny. Gensch's interpretation differed in, in, in important respects from Freud's. He ascribes the uncanny effect to intellectual uncertainty, in particular to, quote, doubt, doubt as to whether an apparently living being is animate, and conversely, doubt as to whether a lifeless object may not, in fact, be animate. With respect to automata, Gensch remarks that, quote, the finer the mechanism and the truer to nature the formal reproduction, the more strongly will the special effect also make its appearance. In this instance, the uncanny feeling is due to what um, Gensch evocatively describes as, quote, the dark knowledge that dawns on the unschooled observer that mechanical processes are taking place in that which, which he was previously used to regarding as a uni unified psyche a statement that reaches to the very heart of the experience of self-estrangement at stake in the practice of surrealist automatism. Gensch cites epileptic fits and the manifestations of insanity because they arouse in us awareness of, quote, automatic mechanical processes at work behind the ordinary appearance of mental activity. He might as well have also referred to sleepwalking. Now, Freud um, adduces uh, Gensch's hypothesis, but then discounts it in favor of his own, which attributes the uncanny to the return of repressed castration anxiety. 
The majority of commentators who apply the uncanny to surrealism, uh, including Foster, uh, implicitly accept the Freudian account. Mike Kelly um, drew largely on a Freudian reading of the uncanny in terms of castration anxiety that he found congenial to his own concern with an aesthetics of lack. Arguably, though, Gentsch's account of the uncanny effects of automata, mannequins, and such like accords much better with the main thrust of his show. Freud, after all, disputed Gentsch's view that the doll Olympia was the source of the uncanny in Hoffmann's The, the Sandman. A consideration of the case of sleepwalking leads me also to prefer um, Gentsch's uh, explanation of the uncanny. <coughs> Overstepping the limits of the home, homely, sleepwalkers are uncanny, uh, unheimlich, literally unhomely, as well as being so by virtue of the automaton-like um, nature of their actions. In this paper, I've lim linked sleepwalking with a domain of strangeness and dépaysement that are quintessentially surreal. Ironically, the overuse of the uncanny, particularly in relation to surrealism, is in danger of domesticating the strange, of diffusing it and rendering it all too familiar. Sleepwalking, without leaving the realm of the everyday, restores to surrealism its essential strangeness. Thank you. Thank you.